Hello, everyone. My name is Philip Palumbo. I'm the host of the Palumbo Podcast, where we interview founders and entrepreneurs and learn about their insights and their perspectives on how they got to the top. Today, I am excited to have with us Peter Sage, who's a motivational speaker, best-selling author. And Peter, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. No, great to be here and uh, excited for our conversation. See what we can do to inspire some people. All right. Sounds good. That's what we're here for. So, Peter, tell me a little bit about, if you can, exactly what you do. Uh, well, uh, I, I, starting at the beginning, I, I dropped out of school at 16. I've got no formal qualifications. Uh, I've been unemployable for 33 years. I've had 27 different companies uh, internationally on different industries. Some have been spectacular successes, yeah, multi eight, nine figure businesses. Some have been phenomenal failures and everything in between. But along that journey, I've always had a passion for personal growth, for self-exploration. And so what I do now is my primary business now in my 50s is essentially share those lessons with other you know, people, founders, you know, uh, um, entrepreneurs, or people that are just looking to uh, get better answers to some questions about their life. And that's really where my, most of my fulfillment now comes from, is just really sharing some of the lessons and the, the mistakes I've made to, to help others stop making it for themselves. Love it. I love it. And I love this subject. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to really dive deep into it. So as you can imagine, my first question is, what are the top lessons that you've learned that could be helpful for founders of businesses? Uh, I would say immediately, you know, it, when, I, when I was really going through my you know, early entrepreneurial career, you know, you're making your first million and you're you know, still striving and everything else. And people would ask me a lot when I, I became kind of successfully at a young age, people would ask me, what is the key secret, the number one? And they'd normally ask you, what kind of skills did you learn? Or what kind of, is it negotiation? Is it marketing? Is it sales? Is it the external stuff? And having been asked this question on yeah, for, for decades now, it's the answer is still the same. The, the defining characteristic of a successful versus an unsuccessful entrepreneur, in my experience, is the ability to handle uncertainty. Yeah, you can learn marketing, you can learn sales, you've got to pivot in tough times, you've got to, you know, the, the entrepreneurial aspect is one thing, but what makes a successful entrepreneur versus not, in my opinion, if I was to pick one characteristic, there's many, but if you were to pick one, I'd say the, 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 log, the key log on that, the ability to handle uncertainty. Because if you don't know how to do that, you're gonna sail a great ship when it's sunny and the storm comes and you're gonna capsize or panic and then will make the wrong decision or you know, end up regretting or backsliding. So that's really the, the primary, uh, I would say, yeah, um, the, the key strength I've seen of successful entrepreneurs. There's no doubt about it. You know, as I think about it as, an, as a business owner myself and founder of my own business, it's, I'm always constantly thinking about where is the storm going to be? And some people may think, oh, you mean storm in the stock market? I'm like, yeah, that's part of it, right? But then just being a founder of your own business and owning your own business, it's understanding the risk that you're exposed to. You know, I just got certified for an exit planning to become an exit plan advisor. And as we, we talked about advising business owners and founders of businesses, before you could get into more of the growth aspect of the business, you really have to tighten up the risks that your, your business is exposed to first before you could launch off to, to grow your business. What are your thoughts as it relates to that? And, and to what you said, essentially. There's a fine line. You can actually spend too much time trying to preempt or control the uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that is a, a throttle to the entrepreneurial spirit. On the flip side, you can't afford to be yeah, cavalier. You can't afford to kind of flip the coin and just, you know, th th there's more than just you on the line when you're the business owner. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah. you're okay to go start over. That's part of the, the, the game. Anyone that's super successful in their first business, it's because they got lucky, right? You know, but when it comes to you know, your family or your employees or people that rely on you to help them pay their mortgage, yeah, it's, it's harder to be cavalier. You know, it's kind of the same transition when people become parents. Yeah, you, know, you don't mind going out and getting drunk and having a hangover and, and being, yeah, you know, uh, dealing with the consequences. But when you've got a two-year-old that needs feeding, that's, you know, it's a different question, right? You, you, right. You're, you're home early. So, yeah, uh, there, there is definitely uh, a requirement to understand risk, but also understand the nature of what you can do and what you can't do 
on what becomes, in my opinion, overkill uh, or redundancy versus, you know, uh, which is again, that ability to handle uncertainty versus being cavalier and, and not giving a crap or just trying to fly by the seat of your pants. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so number one is the ability to handle uncertainty, which I which I totally agree. Um, so, as we, but just to, I just want to elaborate a little bit more on this. So, so when you say handle uncertainty, if we peel the onion back a little bit on that, uh, how would you define that? What makes one founder better than the other when it comes to uncertainty? It's what has to happen for you to feel comfortable, or on the flip side. What has to happen for you to be triggered yeah, uh, as to being uncomfortable? Yeah, you can't be a good CEO if you're lying awake at night at two in the morning because of a yeah a small issue in your business because you're always going to have small issues in the business. Right. Right. The the bigger the issue, the more you're able to deal with it from a calm and centered perspective. The better the leader you're going to be. Yeah. Speed of the leader, speed of the pack. And yeah, if you're able to say, okay, listen, there's a storm coming, the stuff we can't control, let's focus on what we can control. We can control servicing our clients. We can control uh, being able to yeah, manage our cash flow in a more uh, appropriate way. We can control looking for opportunities in the market and executing on them in a way where you know, we bring the best of all of us to the table, whatever it may be. Yeah, you can't control the government, you can't control the economy, you can't control the interest rates, you can't control your competition. Right. Yep. So stressing about that kind of stuff or as we saw in 2020, that was a classic example. Uh, myself included with several friends, we 10 x our business in 2020, not because we were selling PPE and alcohol gel, <laughs> right? right? But because we understood the nature of the storm and we repositioned the sales uh, at an early point where some people were just trying to hoping the storm would pass and it never did. And so, yeah, and you saw a lot of people there with what I call the difference between technicians and entrepreneurs. This is kind of Michael Gerber 101. And he says, most business owners are not business owners. They're technicians that suffered from an entrepreneurial seizure one day and started their own business. And you see that a lot in the difference that between a business owner or an entrepreneur, should I say, and a franchise operator. See, franchise operators are not entrepreneurs. Now, franchise operators are people who are looking for a, the certainty of a system Right. without the risk of trying to create it themselves. Right. So you saw in 2020, those that were more technician minded had a real tough time. Those that were naturally more entrepreneurial forged, yeah, whether that's in the, yeah, the, uh, the, the storms they've been through before, were a lot more open to being able to pivot, to adapt to the situation rather than be you know, ran over by it. Mm. That makes sense. Peter, why do you think entrepreneurs tend to have a better feel of a long-term vision than others? And they tend to be more optimistic, more confident about what they're trying to accomplish versus other who may feel the same way about a certain product or service, but just can't get to the same place as an entrepreneur. The the, the, there's a foundational factor, which I, I really buy into, and that is that outer world follows inner world. Uh, so many people are trying to control the outer world yeah, or trying to you know, carve their, you know, their way out of stone. The, the inner world is, is primary. You know, if you believe in magic, you're going to live a magical life. And so when it comes to entrepreneurs, what separates them from employees is that aspect of vision. Every business began with a vision. Every business, everything that we see in our world began as a thought. The clothes you wear, the seat you sit in, the building you, you, know, you lease or buy began in somebody's mind as a thought, as a vision. Now, for entrepreneurs, that seat building you know, clothes is their baby. That's their business. And so being a visionary, we have to envisage the business before we can build the business. So we're naturally always adapting ourselves or trying to adapt the outer world to the inner vision of what we had or have as it evolves and moves forward. So it's natural that entrepreneurs are going to see things other people can't see because they have to see the business before it's built. Right. Otherwise, it's never going to get built. That makes sense. It makes sense. But it's amazing how they're able to have this vision and have the confidence to take those leaps, you know, just like Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Stark with the, the imaginary bridge, when he, they tell him that, okay, it's there, just trust me. And he takes that step 
and it's there where you know he didn't know that until he took that step right so it's so it's it just amazes me i mean i saw it myself too when i left the major wall street firm to launch my own firm right and here we are four, four years later and it's been the most incredible experience in the world but you when you literally take that leap you don't know how it's going to play out yeah. so it's it's fascinating to me the mind of of a founder you know slash entrepreneur to, to two sides to that depending on on which part of the fence you're on what one is inspiration one is desperation <laughs> yeah so some people are so desperate to yeah uh, avoid the regret of not having tried or they're so desperate to get out of their yeah uh, heart attack waiting to happen stressed out burnt out you know career that they were sold on or the uh the path that they took for the wrong reasons they now see why it was to please mom and dad it was to prove to the world they were good enough and it wasn't anything to do with passion but that undercurrent that energy that that speaks that you know you were born to captain your own ship you can't ignore that when it comes up now you can hide behind the fear and stay stuck in your own job until you have the heart attack or the burnout or what have you or yeah you know, out of desperation you can turn and say no i'm doing it or you go away from what you don't want the flip side is the inspiration it's like your your heart and mind are aligned it's like no one's talking me out of it my friends say I'm crazy. I'm leaving a great paid job. I'm you know, just stay where you are and it'll all work out. You'll get your stock options and your bonuses and your golden parachute and all that kind of stuff. But you know something? That ain't who I am. There's an identity conflict there. And if I don't do this yeah, and if I crash and burn, I crash and burn, but I crash and burn knowing that I did it on my terms. Yeah. And that's, that's the inspiration side. So you see both of those and both have their own you know, pluses and minuses. But you know, a lot of people that don't tap into either end of that spectrum will usually stay stuck yeah, and, uh, and never take that leap. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, the way you just framed that is exactly how I felt. I just knew that there was a better way to do it. I just knew this environment that I was in wasn't the environment that I wanted to be in. And so I, I just had to do it. And, you know, and if I didn't succeed, then, you know, listen, at least I tried and, and there, there were options if I didn't and wouldn't have been great. But that's kind of, that's exactly how I felt. When you talk about when you talk about burnout, when you're a founder of a business and all the things that we're doing, here's what I found, find myself. I find myself saying, oh gosh, that sounds like a great idea. If I implemented that in my business, that'd be great for my clients. And it's like, okay, well, once I implement that, everything should be fine and calm and I'll just, and then I see something else I want to do. And then I, then I hammer onto that and, and I implement that in the business. So it's this constant, I was telling my wife, we were having lunch about two weeks ago, and I was telling this, I'm like, I just never stop my mind. It's like, I see this as an opportunity to help out my business, my clients in this, and it just continues and continues and continues. Does that ever end? I mean, what, what are your thoughts as it relates to that? <laughs> well, what's great about what you're sharing there, Philip, is the fact that, yeah, that's driven by a need to serve. Now, that's great. A lot of people are on that path that are driven by a need to prove. And that, that's two different energies. Right. And for, for many entrepreneurs that I, I, I've worked with and, uh, and, uh, and looked at, there's something that I call, I share it as a metaphor, so if you're, yeah, uh, your tribe resonate with this, I call it the curse of the white rabbit. Yeah, you probably need some kind of like, you know, uh, one, one of those musics off, off Broadway, like dun, dun, dun. But yes, the curse of the white rabbit. And it's really a metaphor that brings home uh, a lot of the awareness of the struggle that entrepreneurs go through like that, the never ending cycle. And I call it the curse of the white rabbit because it's based on the metaphor of a, a dog track. And if you go to a dog track and you have the greyhounds, you open the trap, the greyhounds race around the track. And the reason they run is because they're chasing a white mechanical rabbit. Now the question is, do the dogs ever catch the rabbit? Yeah. Does the business owner ever catch the goals they keep setting? Now, if you look at the game, the game is designed so that the dogs can't catch the rabbit. Yeah, and if they get close, it's like, you know, if I just get this in my business, if I just hit that number, if I just get the next quarterly go, oh, if I just move this piece on the chessboard, then I'll win the game. And there's always another move. And even if we get the moves or get the goals or the quarterly return or the, the whatever it is that we originally set as the goal and we bag the rabbit, another white fluffy tail appears a few minutes later and we're off chasing that again. And yeah, the way that I say is the, 
the reason the dogs don't catch the rabbit is not because they don't run fast enough. It's not because they're not a good enough greyhound. It's not the fact that they you know, sleep in the wrong kennel or they have the wrong diet or the wrong trainer. Yeah, entrepreneurs yeah, don't catch what they believe is their rabbit, not because they're not good enough, which is a fundamental fear that most of them you know, drives most of them. That's right. It's the fact, you, know, you, you imagine getting to the end of a, a, a race and the greyhound's there, and let's say he's talking to his buddy and say, hey, listen, I ran three races this week. I won two of them. Still haven't caught that damn rabbit. You know something? I quit. No. If you get to see the dogs at the end of the race, they're ecstatic. Why? Because they got to run, and that's what greyhounds are born to do. Right. Entrepreneurs build businesses. That's what we are born to do. Now, whether you catch the rabbit or not is you know, a, a different proposition. Why? Because the reason that most business owners aren't happy, fulfilled, the reason most of them are stressed is because, not because they're not good enough, not because their business isn't big enough. Most of them are already past the original number they set when they started their business. They're still just not happy. The reason is because you cannot catch the rabbit of fulfillment, which is really what they're after, by running on the track of achievement. It's just not wired. Uh, if you are trying to catch the rabbit of fulfillment by running on the track of achievement, you, there will always be another rabbit. I made my first million in my early 20s, and I thought by then I'll have made it, right? I was thinking, I'm 17 years old, I drop out of school, and I'm like, be a millionaire. And I'm buying Ferraris for cash, I'm flying Concorde, I'm like doing all these things in my early 20s that my friends are like, oh my God, all right? They're still in the bar spending most of their money by, Friday, by Saturday, right? And I thought when I made my first million, I'd be, ha I'd be happy. Well, no, of course I get my first million. And what happens? Right. right? I'm, I'm, I'm stressed. Why? Because clearly I need two million in case I lose the first. Right? That game never ends. I've yeah. worked with people worth 700 million that are still on antidepressants because they're not a billionaire yet. Right? That game never ends. Unbelievable. So the question is, how do you break the curse of the white rabbit? There's only one way. And it is a paradigm shift. It's never going to happen in the outer world. You break the curse of the white rabbit by understanding you already are that which you seek. Because what you're actually looking for ultimately is a feeling. I want $10 million. Why? So you can stay warm at night by burning the paper? No. Because right? that's the only thing it's got used for in, in terms of material. Well, right. you know, use it as a medium of exchange in order to get a feeling of Accomplishment, maybe significance, maybe certainty, maybe combination, likely. Yeah, it is a feeling. I want to find the partner of my dreams. Why? To either avoid the fear of not being you know, on my own or to get the feeling of love, unconditional love, joy, etc. It's always a feeling. Most people are chasing means rabbits to ends goals. And when you realize that whatever feeling it is that you are searching for, and I'll choose my language specifically here. You have already felt that feeling at some point. It is neurologically coded. Okay? What you've done is change the rules as to what has to happen in order for you to now give yourself permission to feel it. I will finally feel like I've made it when. I'll finally feel certain enough when. I'll finally feel significant enough when. I'll finally feel loved enough when. I'll finally feel healthy enough when. And most entrepreneurs are playing this perpetual game of feel great when, when I catch the rabbit. The people that have really gone past that, that have evolved past that, that have transcended past that, because you never make enough money to get past that. Right. Enough money to realize that what you've been doing is chasing money that was never really the answer. Right. But the people that have played a different game, they've managed to come to a place where they can play the game of feel great now. Not feel great now if, or feel great now because. No, feel great now. That's the, that's the, right. That's what it's all about. But, but, right. First of all, Peter, very well done. Very well, very well said. Very well said. It's amazing. I mean, I had a client that was worth 990 million and he was not happy until he, he reached a billion, literally. Exactly what you said. And that is the mindset of, of, of many people. I think the, at the end of the day, the, the, the game of money is financial freedom and financial freedom is defined by 
what does it cost to run your lifestyle that you hopefully, let's say, let's assume you love your lifestyle, right? What does your lifestyle cost you per year? And if you could have enough money and, and assets to generate cash flow to maintain that lifestyle where you don't have to work anymore, then you know that to me is the end game. That's the, it's financial freedom, right? And and for anybody to be on antidepressants because you're worth seven hundred million and you want to be worth a billion, when you hit financial freedom, whenever whenever you hit that, to me that's preposterous because. The reality is that if you're healthy and you're able to walk and and talk, like that is God's gift right there to, you know, to be so grateful for, right? And and on top of that, you have financial freedom. That's the money game. Because I feel like there's three games. Is there's, there's the health game, things you're doing to keep yourself healthy. There's the family game, things you're doing to be a good husband, wife, and be a good father or mother, and and uh, sibling and 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 son and daughter. And then the third part is money. And the money game, the end game for money is to have financial freedom. And and I and, I, and you know, it's interesting when you have when you have this perspective and you think of it this way, it's a different way to thinking. But yet, like you said, a lot of these entrepreneurs are chasing this white rabbit, like you said before, which, you know, I, I guess I'm guilty of that, but more in like my line of business because of what I want to do to implement things in my business. But and, and the, so I guess, Peter, the other thing, like, and just to turn this on to you is so then people really have to define what the heck makes you happy what really makes you happy and fulfilled that's the question everybody should be asking themselves right whatever that is maybe it's sitting on your couch with the fire reading a book right there's only so many there's only so many beverages and alcohol drinks we could have a week right there's only there's only so much so many restaurants you can go out to Per week, first going out to the restaurant, there's so much salt, there's butter, and there's all unhealthy factors that you'll you'll kill yourself in five, 10 years if you're out to the restaurant every single night. So the question really is, is is what people have to ask themselves is really what makes you happy and fulfilled. So how do you think about what I just said as it relates to what you just said as far as chasing the white rabbit? Good, great, great question. And the challenge is most people wouldn't know how to answer that. Yeah. They've they know how to answer the opposite. They know exactly what makes them unhappy, but they never really sat and tuned in because I think, again, there's a, there's a huge difference between a life chasing success and a life chasing fulfillment. And a lot of people leave it too late to come to that level of realization. For me, it starts with understanding that you know, the, the first part of our life is, is very egocentric. It's really about trying to take care of us, defining ourselves in the world, figuring out what I'm about, what I like, what I don't, uh, and defining my, my sense of self. But once you're at that level of emotional maturity, usually kind of mid late 20s, you shift more from egocentric to ethnocentric to, to more external focusing. And those questions then will always surface, even if we ignore them, which is why am I here? What am I really here for? Because if you know that you're starring in a movie, which you do, Right, which is the movie of your life. And I know that everyone stars in the movie of their life because you know, they're the only person in every single scene of that movie. Now, the problem with most people is that they feel that as the star of their movie, you know, everybody sees them as the star of their movie. And they're desperately trying to look good enough to everybody else as the star of their movie. But you know, if you're the star of your movie, everyone else plays one of two roles either at best supporting cast, wife, sibling, partner, business partner, best friend, handful. But the vast majority of people in your movie are extras. What's the definition of an extra? Somebody who you're not thinking about when they're not in your current scene. Now, when we then get worried about what other people think of us and we have to have all the toys or we have to do this or get to a certain place where we've proved to the world that we're good enough. Right. Then you know, we think that everyone else will finally validate us as the star of our movie. Problem is that they're starring in a different movie, their own, which means by definition, we play one or two roles in everybody else's movie, maybe a handful supporting cast. The vast majority of people that people work their ass off to try to prove to that they're good enough at some level, we're nothing more than extras in their movie, which really means if you are driven at some point of level of external validation, which most people are trying to get to a billion are, right? And yeah, you are uh, driven by what I call goop, the good opinion of other people. 
The reality is that most people don't care enough about you to bother to give an opinion. Why? They're too busy being worried about what they think you're thinking of them. Everyone's walking around in their own bubble of self-importance, thinking, I wonder what you think of me and my bubble of self-importance. Not realizing that they're in their bubble of self-importance, thinking, what do you think of me and my bubble of self-importance? Uh, and so when you, when you start to get that, yeah, not just intellectually, but an emotional level of understanding, uh, you kind of relax a little. I'm blessed to be starring in my own movie. I'm going to play my cards. Brad Pitt doesn't care what the film extras think of him, right? He owns his role. And so as a business owner, in uh, having, be, being in a time in human history that our ancestors have dreamed of, where we've got more access to capital, more access to opportunity, more access to wealth generation, what is the one thing that's stopping me from being happy now in that game? Mm? My own rules as to what has to happen. That's it. And what's preventing me from doing that? Being disaligned with something that's bigger than me about why I'm here. I mean, you have transitioned through levels of emotional you know, development uh, because you know, I can tell you're one of the first drivers that you have is, how can I serve my clients? Not how can I get enough clients to pay for my next you know, Bentley? Right. right. Exactly. You know, it's, it's an ethnocentric you know, external focus. Right. And so you know, that, that, most people don't have meaning behind that. Yeah, they're all too busy trying to secure themselves to cover up insecurities. So, Peter, it's really interesting because I've spoken to people about this, right? For example, people start a business and they, they're like, okay, well, now I got to get on social media. I'm going to go on to various channels. But what is this person going to say about me? What is that person going to say about me? What if they, you know, in, you, in some respects, you are thinking about, it's funny, you are, you're, you're, in, your, you're, you ha, you're in your own movie. Other people are in their own movies. You, you're, they're all, we're all the stars of our own movies. But yet everybody's sort of worried about what the other person is doing. So I guess my question is, is through research and science, I'm just wondering. So like there's this internal voice that goes on that says, oh, if I do this, this person's going to say that. But is that person really going to say that? Or is that just in my head? Based on what you just said, it seems like that person you worried about is in their own movie you're in your own movie. They're not thinking about you like you think they're thinking about you. 100%. And there's two sides. One is that come to terms with the fact that everybody else's opinion of you is none of your business. All right? That's at a personal level. All right? Because if someone's starring in a drama and you're in an action-adventure comedy and somebody comes up and starts spouting their drama into your movie, it's their drama. Right. I'm not going to drop my action-adventure comedy genre yeah, and suddenly become a soap opera just because somebody else is having a tough time in their movie. That's not my deal. Right. Now, if you, if you flip it into business, there is an aspect of that when it comes to things like reputational management, for example. So the, the, there's, you know, I don't want to just be dismissive of that. I mean, uh, we use the platform Trustpilot, for example. And Trustpilot, in our industry, we have the leading Trustpilot score globally. Uh, over 3,000 reviews, we're at 4.9 out of five. Wow. Now, I'm, you know, I'm very you know, proud of that you know, because, again, like yourself, we're, we're about serving and over-delivering to our clients. Absolutely. But, but you're going to get the one-star reviews. You're going to have people that if you give them winning lottery numbers, they're going to hate you for it. Right. right. Some people are so committed to projecting their own torment or their own you know, drama, you know, OPD, I call it, other people's drama, yeah, into onto you, you can't control that. You just need to be true to what it is that your value structure is. And if you mess up, you apologize, you try to correct, but you're gonna have everybody else at some point, and you call it social media. I, I call it anti-social media these days, that's pretty much what it is, right? Everybody's got a platform to be a keyboard warrior to you know, spouse their own horror show into somebody else's movie. And there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. Right? One is to have the courage to focus on how tall you can build your building. The other way is to tear down everybody else's building that looks taller than yours. And you're going to have those people out there. You're never going to have a utopian aspect. But once you put it in perspective, you can actually look at those people more with compassion. There for the grace of God go I, rather than being scared about, oh my God, they're throwing, they're throwing paint at my building. Now, I, I had a 
Um, I got you know, to. So, so, so how how do you coach your clients? Because I can tell you right now, I can almost promise you that if everybody got out of their own head and just did what they wanted to do, like blinders on, you know, like a horse, and just did what they wanted to do, people would be so much more successful. Right. Right. So how do you coach people to not worry about what that other person is going to say or think or whatever it may be? Now I'm talking from a business standpoint. I'm, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about, um, like it is a psychological component, but I'm talking about from a business perspective. All right. Again, control the controllables, right? Your competition are going to find ways to try to pull you down depending on their level of consciousness. Well, absolutely. Right? Your, your job is to blow the socks off your clients. You do that, right? You haven't got to worry about anything. You can, sub, you can weather the storm of other people's rising and falling based upon how well you stand in your own shoes. Right. Now, again, if the business owner is internally insecure, they're going to have a hard time with that. Most of them are. Yeah. Because it is going to be down to, they're going to take it personally. Right. Right. But I, you know, and, and it's hard not to when it's your baby and you've tried hard and, uh, and somebody you know, throws you a, a, a crappy report or a bad customer service feedback or whatever. But one has to understand that is a projection of where they are at. Over time, you know, if you're standing on the right principles, it will all come out in the wash. Now, Again, if you're too busy being worried about what everyone else thinks, that's not an energy that is going to build your business. Oh, absolutely not. It'll get you, you can get out of your own way. It's the worst thing you could do. I just, I just uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody put a, a key down my car. I got a couple of nice cars. You know, one's a McLaren, one's like, you know, I use for the dogs and it's a nice car, but I just parked up for a short while and somebody brought, put a key all the way down and my, my girlfriend saw it. And she's like, oh, why would somebody do that? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, honey, you to understand. A, getting upset about what's already happened is a waste of energy. Right? If the milk's out of the bottle, bitching about it's not going to put it back in. Even if it's ruined your new carpet. Let's take the energy of resistance and put it into what's the next best move. I said, however, there's nothing to look at. Yeah? If you had a choice, would you rather yeah, walk around scratching nice cars or own one? All right. Right? I'm pretty grateful that I'm, I own a car nice enough that somebody wants to scratch. Unbelievable. You know? And thank you for, uh, you know, and send them some love, send them some compassion. Thank you for, you know, be grateful that that ain't your movie. Right, right. Right? Uh, and send them some love. That's a great point. And have, and have that level of, of, of presence about who you are in, in your own movie. Love it, love it, really do. Peter, when you're, owning, when you're running a company, what is the key to being a good leader for your employees? Leaders go there first. Now, if you want to have yeah, authenticity with your staff, be vulnerable. Uh, if you want to have yeah, uh, staff respect you, ha yeah, demonstrate from a place of willing to go there first. Yeah, if that means yeah, you've got to ask them to pull an all-nighter, don't do it while you're in bed. You know, uh, if yeah, they've got to take a, a pay cut, make sure you're taking a pay cut. Uh, you know, they will, I, I learned this a long time ago, actually from my first secretary. In, in my early 20s, I'll be honest, I was an asshole to work for. Why? Because I was so desperately trying to prove to the world that I was good enough to get over the insecurities as a young man that I felt that I wasn't. Right. So everything was done to try to prove, right, that my friend saw me as Wonder Boy. You know, I bought my first Ferrari in my twenties for cash, and I'm like, yeah. You know, and people are like, wow. And I just felt almost like an imposter syndrome, like a failure. I'm, I must have just got lucky. I know I must have needed another business or another business or another business. And because I was equate, I made a classic mistake. I equated my self worth with my net worth. Right. And if. Uh, at that point, if something in the business was threatened in terms of something didn't go right, it could affect my net worth, which would then trigger my self-worth or the fear uh, around not being enough, which means I would then 
bite, I would bit, I would shout, I would control, I would dominate, I would complain, I would I'd catch people doing things wrong rather than catch them doing things right. Because I was scared if the business went down, I would go down. And it was my first secretary that really showed, shared something with me that changed everything. Uh, she said, Pete, you know something? If you treat your staff right, they'll do anything for you. I'm like, whoa. And that really hit home. That's true. It's, 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 really, it's really important. That's really important. So how about culture, right? So when you think about culture, so how do you, how do you create a, a, a great culture for your company? A couple of things. One is to be able to have everybody on the same vision or buying into the same vision or mission of the business. Uh, if you've got somebody there who is there because they need the job that is indifferent to the mission of the job, you are going to poison that culture. Yeah, t team dynamics is everything. Yeah, and as the CEO, we tend to sit too far above that a lot of the time to really see what's happening in the trenches. Right. And yeah, that's where it can fester. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it's something I, te I, I, I teach a three-day business school you know, around the world. In fact, the last year I'm actually teaching it this year, but one of the things I share with my students is that if entrepreneurs tend to hire to fill a hole, you know, because we see a problem with the business, there's a gap, I need that gap filled. And so our focus is on how do we fill the hole? Right. Yeah. Right. Rather than how do we select the right psychological profile, the right value structure, we tend to write, find the first person who fits the ability to do the job so that the business doesn't suffer. And what I've learned over 30 years, Philip, if, I, if I'm permitted to say so on a podcast, is better a hole than an asshole. <laughs> Love it. You know? And so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of business owners hire on resume and they fire on personality. Far better to do the other way around. Yeah. You hire on, per you can teach resume. Now, obviously, in a regulated business like yourself, there has to be certain levels of qualification that, you know, but that's the entry ticket. That's the price of admission. That doesn't get you the job. What gets you the job is your value structure, your heart, your integrity, your personality, your ability to work with others, you know, your ability. If, if I'm looking at a, a business partner, and I've had many business partners over the years, I always go out for dinner yeah, and I, I bring the you know, girls if we've got partners, what have you, whatever. But there's one thing I'm really looking for more than anything else during dinner. How do they treat the staff that serve them? 100%. Ken Langone said that. I say that all the time. My wife and I, and I talked about this when I launched my book and my, and my presentation to the audience about my wife and I when we go out to dinner and how we look the waiters or waitresses in the eye. We ask them their name. And you know, I never want them to feel like I think I'm better than them because they're serving my wife and I for, for dinner or lunch or whatever it may be. But go, go on. I'm sorry. But 100%. Yeah. Because that tells you way more about someone than their, their slide deck. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I love that. I love that. But, but Peter, when you talk about value structure, right? A values of somebody, so, you know, there are different values out there, right? So like I'm Italian, I'm religious, that, you know, certain values that relates to that. So when, when you talk about it in the business world with employees, when you say values, what do you mean about the values of the company and the mission of the company? So when you say values, what do you mean by that exactly? Uh, let's do a, a business partner example. So, you, you guys, so let's say that we both have the same vision, which is, you know, for first part, you've got to be on the same vision, but you have different values. If one person values uh, financial certainty higher than integrity, and you value integrity higher than financial certainty, that's going to cause a clash at some point when they're going to want to take shortcuts in order to make more money. As you a, said financial, certainty, financial certainty versus integrity. Yeah, if somebody uh, is more addicted to certainty and somebody's more addicted to, to variety, then one person's going to want to stick with what works and one person's going to want uh, to channel more into R&D and expansion. You're going to have a conflict. Yeah. Now, when it comes to staff, finding out what they value is more of a tool for you to be able to make them yeah, feel part of the business. Because some people, if they value recognition or praise, they don't care about a pay rise. 
right? Some people value certainty or they value yeah, the significance. A job title, a change in a job title is worth more than a pat on the back. So it's really understanding that the psychological profile of what drives them and taking the time to let them know you care about that. But then acting on what you learn. When you're running a business, Peter, and you, are, you have your revenue, you have your expenses, and then you have profits of the business. With that profits of the business, right, as an owner, you have to make a decision what the profits of those business. Do you want to take all those profits? Do you want to take those profits and put it all back into the business? Right? Or do you want to take half? So if you so if you if you have your business and you take all your profits and put it back into the business, then you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And if something goes wrong with the business, then you have like nothing going on over here and you're broke. So how does one, in your view, should, how should one think about when you have a business, what do you do with your profits? Okay. Uh, multifaceted question with you know, various different levels of context. Depends on the tax structure of the country you're in, for example. Uh, there are certain incentives to reinvest. There are sometimes it, it's paid Absolutely. to take yeah. dividends. But yeah. generally speaking, you want to have a look at what is a, a diversification structure that doesn't divide your time but mitigates your risk and or allows, yeah, you're almost a VC of your own money. Yeah, putting certain asset allocations into different structures, different investments, different yeah, uh, investment vehicles is uh, a smart way to yeah, manage your own wealth, not at the expense of the structural certainty of the business, not at the expense of you know, being too cautious. And that's where you know, companies like yourself really step forward when you know, a business owner's job is to build the business. Yeah, I know how to make money. I've never known how not to make money since I was 17. Managing money, no freaking clue. Right, I, I, I know how to generate wealth, right? I know how to, I, I can't not, for whatever reason, I have a wealth consciousness, I have a prosperity mindset. I read a book on money when I was 17 which I was very blessed to read. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Clayton. Yes. One of the classics. And in there, there was one particular story and the line is summed up beautifully. If you want advice on jewels, talk to a jeweler. And it was about a guy who yeah, got, yeah, got the money that he'd made and went and bought this, you know, what he thought was jewels, but it was scoundrels. They sold him fake glass and everything else. But the lesson was, if you want advice on jewels, talk to a jeweler. If I want advice on wealth management, I want to talk to somebody who understands wealth management. Right. Uh, and that's where people like yourself sit at uh, a very you know, powerful, unique, and, and beneficial position for business owners because business owners aren't wealth managers. No, they're, they're wealth, wealth creators. Right. <laughs> right. I, I, know how to, I know how to spend money. I know how to make it. I know how to spend it. Managing it, I need lessons. <laughs> right. Right, 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 right. Okay, great. So, so um, Peter, anything else you want to add as it relates to running a business, being a founder of a business, that would be helpful? The, the law of conformity is one of the most powerful laws that, that one can work with. In other words, you become who you hang with. If you don't have a peer group, uh, and most people don't, they have a peer group, right? Or a fear group, right? But if you don't have a peer group of entrepreneurial friends or people that you can connect with, yeah, the average person that you went to school with that you, know, you go have a drink in a bar with has no understanding of not being able to make payroll on Friday. Right. They've got no understanding of the fact that you know, my, my ex-CFO was embezzling or they've got no understanding of the fact that you know, the, uh, the bank is, is pulling a credit line. That It's a different lexicon. So having entrepreneurial friends uh, and ones that I would call it high conscious, <laughs> yeah, emotionally mature, let, let's put it that way. Yeah, not people that are driven by the need for significance, not people that are driven by the need to try to prove that, you know, that they'll finally become a billionaire and happy, but people that you can have a grounded conversation with, that you can have one plus one equal in 11. So as, as a founder, if you feel lonely, which most founders do, because your friends don't get you, yeah, your partner's there for support, 
you know, and the, and the life of a wife of an entrepreneur is a different life or, you know, the other way around these days. You know, that doesn't matter. It's not being uh, gender specific, but uh, a supporting partner of an entrepreneur is a different life to somebody who is a, you know, going out and getting a job because you've got a job as well, you know, or looking after the family or what have you. So being around other people that share and understand that life is probably one of the most powerful things you can do. You, know, you, you become who you hang with. I agree with that. I agree with that. Peter, this is excellent. I really appreciate your insight and perspectives. I mean, it was really, really great, especially for people that are founders and entrepreneurs. Um, it's invaluable, the advice that you provided. So thank you very much for that. My absolute pleasure. It's been uh, great to come on and hopefully the tribe will be able to take something from that and uh, inspire us on uh, some of their stories. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Peter. Pleasure.